Untouched was written by Mare Smith and is the second episode of Angel, directed by Joss Whedon. For a Whedon-directed episode, it has a curious lack of flourish. There are no rocket launchers or floating fantasy nightmares or giant snakes, no fancy wonders or arc-changing events. And I think that for the story it is trying to tell, that is absolutely as it should be. If anything, Untouched reminds me a bit of Lie to Me. In the Whedon directorial catalog, these are both stories about characters whose suffering is tragic and unfair and what they choose to do after. The greater scheme, the big picture of Christ. Yeah, Nothing to do with it. There's a lot worse things out there. The system doesn't work in spite of you. Nothing to do works with us. Why is it that I'm not on the floor this time? Take what matters is what we do. The episode opens with Lila snooping through Lindsay's office and being startled by Darla. Lila's fear is oddly humanizing, a reminder that Wolfram and Hart is a company of human beings, mostly ignoring their consciences. Darla shows Lila the source of her mojo over Angel. Corinthian powder? Is that how you keep Angel sleeping when he's with you? Mm. Wesley and Cordy are debating whether they should pay gun, and Angel gets the grumps. How about we pretend that you work for me? You are really unpleasant. Then why don't we pretend that you don't? You can't fire me. I'm Vision Girl. Cordy is such an icon, and I love Angel's uncontrollable smirk here. I've been sleeping weird. Weird how? As with Nabbit in the previous episode, I treasure reminders of Wesley's competence. Here, he's the first one to take a concerned interest in Angel's dream state, not the first time he was on top of the issue of Angel's subconscious. But before they can get into it, the powers that be send a vision of a young woman being attacked in an alley. The timing of the episode's vision in the opening seems curious. Just as Wesley is taking an interest in Angel's troubling sleep patterns, Cordy is struck. If we didn't know any better, it would almost seem like the powers want the apocalypse. Angel heads off to do the hero thing. Oh god, he's gonna be too late. This neat little bait and switch makes us believe that we're about to watch this woman be raped and murdered by these two men. As a result, we as the viewers are forced to experience a small measure of the terror, futility, and cosmic unfairness of the crime. But the woman in question carries out the trash. When the cops arrive, Angel sneaky sneakies onto the crime scene. Do you want to pretend that's on a Cub Scout uniform and tell me about dead people? This kind of shtick used to feel out of character, but I think at this point, him improvising and acting out has been properly built up as he's accumulated experience in this job, including the painting in She, the desperate husband in the doctor's office in I Fall to Pieces, and Herb Saunders in Sense and Sensitivity. Herb Saunders, Baltimore. It's Herb Saunders. Not to mention Angelus in the Buffy episode Enemies. The world's best actor. Second best. Angel finds the woman in a back room, and she's freaked. This is Bethany. After he is able to withstand a skewering, Angel offers her a place to stay, but Bethany says she's staying with a friend who turns out to be Lila. I'm sorry I couldn't make it. Work just got insane, and her new clients are monsters. With Lila, any of those statements could be literally true. Cute. Gunn stops by Angel Investigations and shows off his new axe he's endearingly happy with. All great warriors have an iconic weapon. Buffy has Mr. Pointy, Angel's he never needs to draw, Wesley is pretty damn sharp with a pistol, and Gunn has his hubcap axe. I love it. Men are all alike. The fair Cordelia. You still saving my life? Every minute. I never realized how much I wanted this ship, more than any of the others, to happen. The two coolest, most charismatic members of Angel Investigations. Also, some growth. Gunn acknowledged her without defensiveness, called her by her name, not chick, girl, queen, or whatever. I like it. Angel puts Gunn on the hunt for Bethany, who is having nightmares about a man coming and taking young her from a hiding spot in the attic. Lila is amused until she takes a lamp to the face. Fearing she'll hurt anyone but Angel, Bethany flees to the hotel. Darla is in Angel's bedroom again, filling his head with hunty-killy sexy things until Bethany shows up. But she's still buying Lila's deception and alerts Lila as to her whereabouts. Wesley has a theory and tests it by deliberately antagonizing Bethany. Well, maybe we should send you home to your father. 
As much as this episode demonstrates Wesley's competency, he may still have some things to work through, as he came up with a plan and didn't bother running it past any of the team, as with his attempted capture of Faith in Buffy Season 3. The sort of trauma that can produce this level of psychic power usually involves abuse of some kind. Statistically speaking, the father was the best guess. I wonder if Wes might have been uniquely qualified to recognize something like this. A father doesn't have to be possessed to terrorize his children. He just has to... In the midst of another orgy dream of sex and violence, Bethany wakes Angel and... I figured we'd have fun. You can do stuff to me and, you know, we'll have some fun. Hmm. Let's come back to this scene in a moment. Turns out the men that attacked Bethany were hired to trigger her. Gee, I wonder who would have... It was Lila. Cordy takes Bethany on a walk, and they have a tough conversation. Uh, don't blow my boss. What? At the end of the first season, when the phantom of the law firm opened the vision floodgates to all suffering, we saw the visions could force Cordelia to literally experience the emotions of the people she saw. A kind of magical empathy. You don't know how scary it was. Yes, I do. I had a vision of you. I felt everything. Her scene with Bethany here is another step in her arc, showing that the visions in her work with Angel Investigations is growing and maturing her. Somewhere in that moment of panic, a decision got made, and I don't want something like that to happen to my friends. Bethany gets drugged and captured, Angel does his Dark Knight thing, and then Lila sends in an explosive charge. Hello, Rabbit. The first few times I watched this episode, I always thought the dad was Kyle Chandler from Friday Night Lights, which made his role that much more disturbing. But the actor who plays Bethany's father is actually named Gareth Williams. In either case, the performance just has the off-kilter, creepy niceness that feels unsettling and yet uncomfortably realistic. And at Angel's behest... You've got the power. Use it. Bethany sends Dad packing, but catches him before he hits the pavement. And after Angel helps Bethany get her stuff back, Lila ends the episode with a taunt for him. Sweet dreams. Untouched is an episode that deals with powerfully difficult subject matter. This isn't the first time the Buffyverse has grappled with abuse, though I don't think it's ever felt quite this raw. In Beauty and the Beasts, there was Debbie, who kept coming back to Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Pete. Unlike Bethany, Debbie felt, to me, more like a trope. I, um, oh. Fell down. It sure. Than a living character. There were passing hints to abuse in Faith's past. Oh, my dead mother hits harder than that! <laughs> but Mom was so busy, you know? Enjoying the drinking and passing out parts of life that I never really got what I wanted. But mostly, we were just witness to its consequences as Faith dealt with her anxiety and identity issues in a spiral of violence. But with Untouched, the ugly is front and center. Bethany's abuse and its consequences are shown to us directly, and her desperately attempting to cope with it in both healthy and unhealthy ways feels painfully human and real. So much so that the first couple of times I watched the episode, I wasn't sure how I felt about it all. Sexual abuse is such a triggering and heavy issue that I kept asking myself the questions I brought up in the review for First Impressions. Does the use of this subject matter find something new and innovative to say? Does it turn the prism of our perspective and reveal something interesting? Does it do its victim justice? The more I've watched this episode, the more I've come to believe it does. Bethany bears obvious references to Harry, which was also a story about a girl with telekinesis dealing with abuse. But her red hair and past seem like nods to Beverly in It. Daisy McCracken does a wonderful job playing her with tough material. Bethany is never just a damsel, and the script is surprisingly willing to let her be at times unlikable. But what a disservice to Bethany and her story it would have been to have her be anything other than the full embodiment of herself. And this time through, I was struck by how painfully true one of her coping mechanisms was. The Mayo Clinic defines a dissociative disorder as one that involves experiencing a disconnection and lack of continuity between thoughts, memories, surroundings, actions, and identity. People with dissociative disorders escape reality in ways that are involuntary and unhealthy and cause problems with functioning in everyday life. Bouts of dissociation are common to victims with post-traumatic stress disorder, and its symptoms include memory loss, a sense of being detached from yourself and your emotions, inability to cope 
well with emotional or professional stress, mental health problems such as depression, anxiety, and suicidal thoughts and behaviors. The pivotal scene in the episode comes when Bethany tries to sleep with Angel in his bedroom, and she expresses, I figured we'd have fun. You can do stuff to me and, you know, we'll have some fun. At first glance, this might seem vaguely reminiscent of Tina offering Angel his reward in City of. Not like he didn't earn it. No. But when Angel turns Bethany down, there's an extra layer revealed. Are you shocked I'm a great big slut? Bethany's conclusion about the evil done to her is that she must be a horrible thing herself. And I was reminded of... In that scene, Faith desperately wanted to disappear at Angel's hand. Kill me. Just kill me. And, by way of her dissociative disorder, Bethany uses physical intimacy with men to do exactly the same thing. I'm like the chambermaid. I just leave. When a guy's on me, I... I made up the room, I showed him in. And I leave till he's gone. Come back and clean up the mess. And I have to admit, when it dawned on me what she was doing, Bethany, a victim of sexual abuse using dissociation on purpose as a means of escaping her suffering to metaphorically destroy herself, I broke down. This scene is gut-wrenching. In her interview on the Debatable podcast, Mayor Smith said that other than the Lila scenes, Joss Whedon rewrote most of her script. According to Mayor, Joss took Bethany from a mostly passive victim to one that was grappling with her trauma aggressively. The idea being that there is no one textbook reaction to abuse. Certain people shut down. Certain people turn outward. Again, to limit Bethany to one or the other would have been to do her a disservice. It sometimes feels feels miraculous the way Mutant Enemy can grapple with these themes and somehow also intertwine them with the ongoing arc and plights of the main characters. While some of the connections with Angel have yet to play out, there are notable parallels already. Angel loses himself when he becomes Angelus. He's just not there anymore. Though, I don't believe the curse kicking his soul out happened because of physical intimacy, but the moments of post-coital bliss after the fact. Bethany and Angel are also similarly closed off. I don't want to talk about me and share or whatever. Oh, Phil, I don't want to share my feelings. I don't want to open up. Both powers emerged from something dark, regardless of what they choose to do with them. Bethany sees herself as a freak. Her powers are not a gift, but a curse. It's not a parlor trick. It's... It's a disease. Just like Angel's vampirism. Remember his expressed self-hatred when Buffy tried to tend his wound in What's My Line. You shouldn't have to touch me when I'm like this. But Buffy just saw him grappling with and accepting the power and darkness that comes with his vampirism and working out how to integrate it as a part of his complete identity is one of Angel's ongoing struggles in the series. I think it's especially important to note that Bethany's suffered abuse is clearly posed as a mirror of what Darla did to Angel and what she is doing to him now. Darla's violations are sexual assault. Bethany comments that the dreams Angel was having sounded pretty enjoyable, and when speaking to Lila earlier in the episode, Darla attempts to justify her actions as revealing Angel's true nature. There's nothing so lovely as dreams. Everything's in them. Everything hidden. Open those chambers and you can truly understand someone. This is a fear that Angel has expressed over and over again. It was showing me. Showing you? What I am. You were in the dream, you know. It told me to lose my soul in you and become a monster again. I know what it told you. What does it matter? Because I wanted to! And it is also unequivocally false. We as individuals are not defined by our fears or ugly impulses, which we all have but by our choices. And whatever Angel's seeming pleasure expressed while completely disarmed in his dream state, the fact remains that he was unable to give consent to what was and is happening to him, which makes Darla's actions absolutely abuse. All of this adds up to making the climactic scene with Bethany's father even more stunning. In the end, Bethany does what Liam was unable to do in The Prodigal, and claims her power, not by ending the life of her tormentor, but by realizing that she didn't have to let him control her her or her future. But 
Did Angel know she was going to do that? His command stated to Bethany as she holds her father aloft in the final scene is curiously ambiguous. Notice what he doesn't say. You've got the power. Use it. Finish it. He didn't tell her not to hurt him. 